So in any case, uh, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, we're going to go to question and answer shortly, but in the meantime, we have a special uh, gift for you all. Uh, we have a, a national economist who we brought in just for the sake of this meeting, uh, who's going to tell us more about the economic case for raising the minimum wage, because as we all know, it's time for a raise. Thank you very much.
show I want to, well, that second point I was trying to show is, you know, there isn't any relationship really with the national economy and what the federal minimum wage is. So what we have besides the federal minimum wage is that gray line is the national unemployment rate. The federal minimum wage has gone up when the unemployment rate has been high. The federal minimum wage has gone uh, up when the federal minimum, uh, when the unemployment rate has been low. It has gone up and down, sort of on its own uh, trend, not really related to the national unemployment rate. So you know, when you hear these arguments that this is not the time to do it, this is the time to do it, you know, these two things don't really move together. So it's not about the national unemployment rate. It's really about whether you put the will to set a labor standard at a particular level. And, and again, you know, as I was trying to point out, there are many states across the United States that have their own state minimum wage that's higher. We have over 19 states, and then also California, that have a minimum wage that's operating in this state that's higher than minimum wage. And we have the Washington state minimum wage is currently at 9.99. We have a whole range of what has been passed um, across the country. That's just to give you a context for what we're talking about when we talk about um, minimum wage um, proposals. It really is a political question of money. And you know, one, the number one reason is you know, the, the argument that I often hear about minimum wage is that businesses cannot adjust to other minimum wage increases because cost increases are too high and it's going to cause them to cut back on their jobs and the hours of their workers. So I just wanted to impart that what, from what I have studied, businesses, what we have seen businesses can adjust to other minimum wage without paying jobs. I'm going to go through some of the numbers with you. The primary take home point of this is that the cost increases are very modest relative to what businesses can absorb, what the capacity is to absorb uh, kind of changes. <coughs> so, in the years that I've been doing these studies, we've been very careful to think about whether or not the cost increases are too high for businesses. We think very carefully, well, what is it that we go about for businesses? We look at the mandated raises that businesses would uh, adjust to. So, that's all the workers in this proposal with their earnings. We also take account ripple effect raises. We often hear in the around minimum wages, well, it's not going to be just those workers who are going to raise, but workers who earn a little bit above that, and that's going to ripple up through the wage, wage structure. We take into account those ripple effect raises. And we take into account that when the wage bill for an employer goes up, the taxes also go up. We take together all these cost increases, add them up, and then compare them to the capacity for businesses to adjust to those cost increases. And a key figure that we come up with is that for uh, an industry like the fast food industry, which has you know, the highest concentration of minimum and near minimum wage workers, their full cost increase relative to their sales revenue in this proposal would be, uh, this is based on the past few weeks specifically done, on the order of 2.7% for their sales revenue. And so, you know, one way to think about it, and this is something that comes from Grace Book pointed out, I was talking about this no, if you want to fully cover half the cost, and I say half the cost because there are a multitude of ways this is going to aside from this price increase. If they covered fully half the cost increase through price increases, you're talking about a five cent increase in the price of the price, four dollars to four dollars five cents. So I'm trying to give you that concrete example of how <coughs> cost increases work for the business. So, you know, it's not no surprise that when you look at these, when you survey over the economic research that's been done on the wages, and there has been a ton of research that's been done on the wages that we find that businesses actually do adjust to minimum wage increases without paying jobs. And again, I just want to go through, you know, what we've seen in research is that there are a multitude of ways that businesses adjust. So, for example, we do see evidence of higher prices. The amount of uh, price increases that we see on the order of what I just talked about. We also see that some of the cost increases are offset by the fact that there's a lower turnover rate in the business. That is, Employers have to spend less money on recruiting, hiring, and training workers because fewer of their employees, employees are leaving. They're staying on longer. They're taking advantage of the workforce, and those workers um, have to use uh, more, you know, more productive workers. Another interesting observation that was done that was found in the research is when they surveyed a bunch of fast food managers, when, um, they asked them, "Well, how did you adjust to the most recent minimum wage increase?" That was from 2007 to 2009. They brought the minimum wage from 515 to 75. And one of the things that they said was it actually spurred them to look for operational efficiencies because they thought, "Well, now my cost of living increase some. What can I do to offset that? And let me look for efficiencies." And you can think about it on a real human level. We all have a company that's breaking the environment to do this. 
we can't do them all the time, so we prioritize. And for these managers, what they found is when they knew that there was going to be a consequence, they pushed up in their priority list by their operational efficiency. They need to figure out how to have the confidence to offset these consequences. And that seems like a little bit of a for us. Finally, there's also the idea of just redistributing revenue. You know, the sales revenue that's brought into these firms can move from the highest paid workers to the lowest paid workers, from profits to the lowest paid workers. So these are different ways that business can adjust. And you want to keep in mind, too, that cutting back, back on hours and jobs you know, as a response to minimum wage, that is not by itself costless. It doesn't just save labor costs. You're losing workers that you have kept on because you know how they work. You know that they know your business. You're going to be losing a valuable employee. You cut back on hours, and it's hard to use the services and products you can produce it. So you know, the idea that the minimum wage is going to go up and uh, the easy response is to cut back on hours and jobs. It's not a So I want to just go through what's been happening more recently around this question about whether or not jobs are lost if minimum wage is good luck. And there's this um, study that was done in 2009 that I find really compelling because it's what's called a meta-analysis. It's a study of studies. It takes all these studies that happened over 1970 to 2007, looking at minimum wage happening in the US, and looked at estimates and sort of plotted them out to see, well, what do we find on average when we look at studies a plot that has have been used in the economic system. If you look at 1,400 different estimates, of that over 64 studies happened over 1970-2007, what they find is that the, the most precise estimates all cluster around an estimate of zero impact on the economy. So this is, you know, there, there are a lot of fights amongst economists about what the actual impact would be. But if you take a survey of all of these research has been done, and you try to take an objective standard to what these results are, this, I think, provides the best example of how you do that. You say, let's take all the estimates, see how they lay out, and what we find is the most, the most precise estimates all cluster around the other estimates. Finally, there's a really interesting research that's done by a colleague of mine, Eric Duvet, and a couple of his colleagues, um, a little bit of and And what they did was, you know, with the many different state and wage increases that we've experienced in the U.S., they were able to compare counties, two neighboring counties, each on one side of the state border, where one state raised its minimum wage and one state didn't. So for example, a uh, county in Florida on the border between Florida and Georgia and South uh, Georgia, they looked at what happened to employment in the restaurant industry, for example, when Florida's minimum wage went up, so it's Georgia food. So they're looking at two labor markets that are very close together and saw, well, what happened? What they found was that there was no employment impact. They looked at 318 different county pairs at this time. They would straddle a state border, one state raises its minimum wage, the other one doesn't. And what did they find? <coughs> so this, I think, is a real advance in the literature on how to study minimum wage. And what we found is that there's no central impact. Now, an argument I think is very often awesome is this, this uh, argument that minimum wage hikes cause inflation. So I just want to say minimum wage hikes do not cause inflation. I just want to go back to the argument I just made. The cost increases to businesses are affected by the minimum wage increases are very modest. There's no reason for so, uh, you know, going back to the cost of food, if you, you know, I talked about the fact that the industry where there's a high concentration of motor workers. If you look at the average industry, the average, you know, which doesn't have a lot of low wage, minimum, near minimum wage workers, who therefore aren't going to be giving a lot of raises to their employees, if you're talking about a cost increase to sales revenue ratio of one half or one percent. So again, to give you a real concrete example, you're talking about they would be able to fully cover the cost increase of their um, uh, increase from the minimum wage hike uh, of this proposal by raising prices by half of one percent. So a twenty dollars So price increases of that size certainly aren't going to cause an inflationary spiral in the U.S. And I just want to go to just touch uh, on the three factors of why costs are so small because you know I don't want people to feel like I'm just making up these numbers. It goes back to something that Thomas said. So I'm just going to reiterate. A lot of businesses don't have minimum wage and minimum wage workers. So their labor, their labor bill is not going to be affected by this um, minimum wage proposal very much. A large share of their costs are not due to labor at all. So again, you're looking at just a portion of their costs um, when you're talking about their um, wage labor. And finally, when you look at the average wage across the workers that are going to get uh, raises, 
If you look at the average raise, it's not the full amount of the because you see workers who do not just between 75 and 50 years work up to 12 dollars a raise, but their raises are much smaller. Well, on average, you have a smaller um, average mean wage than a 25 percent person. Right. And I just want to underscore this point because I hear many times that I've been in debates around the wages. Somebody saying, "Look, if you raise the minimum wage by say 45 percent, that's going to impact the whole wage structure. Everybody else above that is going to get 45 percent." Wage That's not the case. I, I, I spent my dissertation research on this. I, I can show you the evidence that what you see is the wages at the very bottom go up. But as you go up in the wage structure, the raises get smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's not, there's no inflation in pressure from the minimum wage. And the final point I want to make, the final basic fact that is lost in the debate a lot, is this question about whether or not minimum wages are really important to um, households, standard public, because there's the argument made that workers for many years or college students are just like, you know, spending money that they're just going to go and spend on, say, here or, you know, I don't know what. But what, when you look at the average worker who gets a raise from the what you find is they, on average, contribute 40% of their household income. So this is a substantial share of household income. Now, one thing you'll hear a lot is that, okay, a minimum wage earner is a secondary earner, but I think most people in the U.S. know that the secondary earner can also be a substantial earner in the household, and this statistic should um, illustrate that. You may not be making the majority of the income from your household, but you're making 40%. That is a substantial amount of the household income. And if your wages go down or your wages go up, the household standard of living will go up or down um, based on that. And so just to give you a sense of what, you know, what kind of living standard increase you might expect from a 45% minimum wage hike, I just did a, a rough estimate thinking about, well, you know, given the average minimum uh, worker who um, benefit from the minimum wage increase on the order of 45%, you know, given that they contribute about 40% of the household income, and that the average worker gets about half of the, the, the wage hike, so about 22%, if you just do the math, we're talking about a 9% increase. Now, if you think about what's been happening in the U.S. economy since the recovery, the recovery started in 2009, and a lot of families are not feeling like they are experiencing the recovery. And there's a good reason for that. An economist, Emmanuel Sanz, produced a paper in 2013, earlier this year, that showed that the top 1% of households increased their income by about 9% over the two years of recovery that we've been looked at. But about 99% had seen their wages for their incomes flatline and actually decreased by the European. Now, if the average household that has a minimum wage earner or a near minimum wage earner that benefits from this minimum wage proposal experience a 9% income increase, you would be talking about something more like the recovery for these households. So, really, restoring minimum wage to something on the order of 10 dollars to start to make recovery really feel like a recovery for millions of workers um, in their households. I just want to close by saying I want to underscore the importance of this kind of labor standard because one thing is that um, Congressman Grayson talked about, and I just want to um, underline, is that we really need to be thinking about the quality of the jobs that we use in the U.S. Because I think in the headlines we see the unemployment rate is coming down, and that's really good news. And it is really good news. But if you look at the, the composition of the jobs that are being added to the U.S., you're looking at a lot of jobs in low-wage industries. So, for example, over the last year, uh, four low-wage industries here added about 60% of the new jobs being added to the economy. So these are jobs in retail trade, administrative waste services, a lot of these jobs are temporary health service uh, jobs, accommodation and food services, we're talking about jobs. Health care and social assistance, a lot of these jobs are home care, health assistance uh, jobs. These are all um, <coughs> jobs that pay below average wages. So we're adding jobs. We're adding jobs more, and that's really good news. The job quality of these jobs are not as good. Finally, I just want to point out, this is actually a long-term trend that we're talking about. If you are looking at the U.S. from 1979 to 2011, there has been about a quarter of the workforce that has been making $10 an hour or less. This is all inflation adjusted dollars. Now, this is despite the fact that more adults are putting themselves into college and getting some college experience. What the number is, is 41% in 1979 had some college experience. Today, it's 64%. 
despite that, we still have a significant share of low-wage workers. And what we have as a result is that there are better educated low-wage workers. Now you have 25% of workers who earn $10 or less who have some college experience in the past. Now 43% have some college experience. They've acquired more skills, but their wages remain to be very low. And you know, the Labor Department provides every uh, few years projections about which direction the U.S. economy is going to go. And I keep on looking at these to see there's going to be any change. But what I find over and over again is that the jobs that the Labor Department itself is projecting is that about two-thirds of the jobs in the U.S. that are going to be added are going to uh, be in occupations that don't require um, any college experience. That's the same as today. So we're not expecting new, high-quality jobs. Um, what we're going to be finding is more and more jobs in these types of services. And so this sort of underscores the importance of how important the labor standard of the wage is. That we are adding jobs in the low wage industry, so we need to put a backdrop that was this robust, that um, was going to affect a significant proportion of the workforce. And hopefully the sort of five basic facts that I showed you about the minimum wage, you can give some um, information to show why we would anticipate that to be helpful and not helpful for the workforce. Thank you, Dr. Slim. <laughs> I have a big enough voice. And thank you, Congressman Grayson.